Hello team, Coach Tickety here with an in-depth look at Junker Queen, Overwatch's newest addition to the tank line. We're going to be breaking down her kit and looking at how to best play into her strengths while trying to avoid some of her weak points. I've been basically one-tricking Junker Queen since the relaunch of the Overwatch 2 beta and have been having a blast, so I can't wait to share this one with you guys. Let's start by jumping right into her kit. Her primary fire, the Scattergun, is a hitscan shotgun that fires a random spread, but has a slightly more effective range than other existing shotguns in the game like Roadhogs or Reapers. It feels like the effective range is somewhere in the middle ground between Hog's primary and secondary fires. You can get a little bit more distance than others, say around 10 meters, before you start noticing meaningful damage fall off. It has a six round clip, and does 80 damage with a full body shot, meaning 160 damage if you manage to hit every pellet into the head. This is a very sizable amount of damage and can lead to some very heavy burst damage. Her secondary fire, the Jagged Blade, Gracie, throws out her knife that can be recast to pull targets towards her. So let's break down how this works exactly. First cast is a projectile that has a somewhat similar arc to Ana's Biotic Grenade, except it travels slightly faster and therefore has a longer trajectory. Once thrown, the knife will travel for a maximum of about 60 meters, but has a maximum airtime of 1.5 seconds before it automatically returns to Junker Queen. If it manages to hit a target, it will do 80 damage on hit, apply a wound, and we'll talk a little bit more about wounds later, and then can be recast to pull any stuck targets 10 meters towards Junker Queen. On its way back, whether it hits uh, a target or whether it hits terrain and is pulled back, or whether it's just in the air before flying back to you, on its way back, it will also apply wounds to every target in its path. Once stuck, the dagger will linger for three seconds, either in targets or on terrain, before automatically returning, but can be recast to pull back like I mentioned. It has a six second cooldown that starts when it is thrown, meaning you can arc this for 1.5 seconds in the air, leave it stuck in a target for three full seconds, and then by the time you're pulling it back, it's only got about two seconds left on the cooldown before you can cast it again. The pull itself, when you do stick targets, functions closer to a boop like Lucio's more than a hook like Hogs. It does not apply crowd control effects, meaning it will not interrupt cooldowns, and the boop that it applies is not nearly as strong as Roadhog's hook. So the boop itself will do things like interact with terrain, meaning you can't pull targets around corners like you sometimes can with Roadhog's hook. And you can actually do some interesting tech here that some members of the community have found where you can boop targets into parts of the terrain or even into yourself while you're crouching to cause them to go in a longer trajectory themselves. How exactly are we going to be using the knife throw in game though? At first glance, you might think that this will function similarly to Roadhog's Hooked, and you'll be looking to create early picks and burn down targets easily with early kills, but in practice, it doesn't really function that way super effectively. While the effective range is longer than Roadhog's Hook, it is very difficult to hit the projectile at those ranges, and the most you'll be looking in terms of pick potential will likely be environmental kills, again, similar to how Lucio is looking for boops, maybe on maps like Ilios Well or Nepal Sanctum, for example. The main use for this that I've found to be effective in games of Overwatch 2 is as part of a chase down or target isolation priority when you're brawling in the middle of a team fight. So what this means is once you're able to get onto a target, sticking them with the knife ensures that they have no way out no matter what they do. The 80 damage it does as well is more than enough to help you secure kills sometimes, but if they are able to survive your burst damage, having the knife stuck in them will mean that you can pull them back into you and keep them within melee range for a lot longer than if you didn't have this in your kit. In addition to that, it's always good to have as much bleed going on as possible, so in the middle of team fights, whenever you can, you will be looking to stack bleed on multiple targets, and if possible, you will be looking to pull the knife back to you and have it cross through multiple targets, because like I said, every target that it hits on its return trajectory will apply a wound to. Next, let's look at her shift ability, Commanding Shout. It instantly gives you a 200 HP over health buff and 100 HP over health to your allies within 20 meters, which works in a sphere, so it will hit allies above and below you. It also increases your movement speed by 30%, which is 5% more than Lucio's passive speed aura. So it's not 
a ton. It's not like Lucio's speed boost when he's amping speed, but it is a noticeable amount in game and it can help you escape some sticky situations. The overhealth and speed buff lasts for 4 seconds once cast and has an 11 second cooldown that doesn't start until the effect has ended. Similar to the throwing knife, it might seem like this is a good initiation tool, something you'll want to start a fight with, but I found that the engage potential off this cooldown is relatively weak. This is not something you want to be burning too early in a fight because it is your only defensive tool in your kit as Junker Queen to keep yourself and allies alive. And the movement speed you get from it isn't really enough to close meaningful distances, meaning this is going to be used mainly as a stabilization tool or as a counter engage tool. You're going to want to wait for situations where you're going to benefit from the 200 HP and 30% move speed rather than try and cast this early and walk into a team fight. This can be an excellent tool for turning the tide on enemies who think they've got the advantage over you and then quickly shut them down with that extra HP and movement speed to help chase them down once they turn tail and start running. Next ability, Carnage, which is bound to her E key on keyboard, is a axe swing that deals 90 direct damage and again applies a wound. The range of the axe is slightly further than a quick melee. It's about the same as Reinhardt's hammer swing, which is around 5 meters, and it functions very similarly to Reinhardt's swing. It has a lingering hitbox, meaning you can turn your camera as you're swinging to hit a larger area of influence. It also has many of the same interactions as Ryan's hammer. For example, Genji's reflect will block the damage of the axe, although the wound effect will still be applied. It has an 8 second cooldown, and this one's uses are pretty straightforward. You want to hit as many juicy targets as possible, apply as much damage, apply as many wounds, and use it as part of your burst damage. 90 damage is not something that can be easily ignored by most opponents, so use this to catch people off guard and finish off vulnerable targets in burst situations. You're going to look for as many opportunities as possible to get this on high priority targets, but even onto tanks, Almost 100 direct damage on a direct hit means that you can quickly burn them down as well, especially with the follow-up damage of your shotgun if you're in melee range. Finally, her ultimate rampage is quite a flashy one. Time for the reckoning! Junker Queen will start with a 1 second wind up before charging forward 25 meters and applying an AoE wound debuff and anti-heal to all targets hit for about 5 seconds. The size of the AoE around her is a bit larger than you might expect and extends about 5 meters in a radius around her. Again, this applies both above and below you as well, so you will hit targets in the air, or if you're, if you're using this off of a high ground, you will hit targets below you as well. And the amount of damage it does is very sizable. Again, we'll, we'll talk about the wounds in a second, and we'll talk about how they differ between each ability, but let's talk about the usage for Rampage at first. Again, another tool that seems best used for Engage, and this case... You're not wrong. This one is excellent for starting the fight. The anti-heal it applies, the only other anti-heal in the game being on his nade, has proven to be extremely effective at starting and sometimes finishing fights. So using this on as many grouped up opponents is an almost guaranteed fight win in a lot of situations. There are a lot of good things that happen when you hit people with 100 bleed damage that can no longer be healed back due to the anti-heal. Look to hit as many people as possible, but also, once we start talking about wounds, Think about this as a potential self-preservation tool since the damage you're doing will begin healing you as well. So what does that mean? Where are we getting this healing from? Looking at her passive adrenaline rush. Um, the different abilities that Junker Queen uses apply these wounds that we've been talking about. And 100% of the damage that you do via wounds, which is this ticking bleed damage that applies to enemies, will heal directly to Junker Queen's HP pool. This means that every time you're hitting people with a jagged knife, every time you're hitting people with carnage, every time you're ulting multiple targets, especially with rampage, you're going to see your HP Bart filling itself as the fight ticks forward. But looking at the numbers between the wounds, there are some key differences to keep in mind here. So I put out this tweet a little while ago about how not all wounds are created equal, and this breaks down what exactly you can expect from the different types of wounds you'll be inflicting. If we're talking about the melee or jagged knife throw, or pullback of course, we'll be doing 15 damage over 2.7 seconds. And of course that means we'll also be healing 15 damage over 2.7 seconds. If we're hitting an enemy with carnage, our E ability, we'll be doing 55 wound damage over 2.9 seconds. And then finally rampage, and worth noting rampage is the only one on this list that doesn't have direct damage tied to it. This is purely bleed damage that this ability does. 
but every target hit will take 100 bleed damage over about 4.8 seconds. And this applies to every single target hit. And again, with Rampage, with that anti-heal, that's 100 damage that cannot be healed back over about 5 seconds. This is an incredible tool for getting into fights, keeping yourself well sustained due to the passive healing, and of course using that bleed damage to apply extra pressure in addition to your strong melee burst damage. This character does a ton of damage, and if she's not doing damage, she won't function as well as a tank due to the way her passive heals her. So make sure you're always looking to apply these wound stacks, and making sure you're thinking more about using her melee than you probably are with any other hero. So, how do we use this kit? How do you play Junker Queen in your average game of Overwatch 2? First, let's talk a bit about her damage breakpoints. So, looking at doing 200 damage burst. And this is important for most characters because the majority of the DPS and support cast will be at that 200 damage mark. So, there's a couple combos we can look into. First is the obvious one, very similar to Roadhog, is hitting a target with the Jagged Knife pulling them towards you, hitting them with a full body shot with your shotgun, and then following up with a quick melee. All of this, the direct hit from the knife, the direct body shot from your primary fire, and the melee, will do exactly 190 damage without bleed. If you manage to hit any amount of headshots from your primary fire after pulling them, or if you can rely on that bleed damage finishing them off without them getting any healing to keep them up, this will kill most targets. Like I mentioned though, it's very hard to get into effective range, to get within that 10 meter range to make sure you're pulling them close enough to finish them off with your shotgun. So just keep this in mind that if you land a jagged knife on a priority target in the middle of a team fight and you can focus them down, you alone can almost take them from 200 HP to zero in a matter of basically one second. Next combo we'll look at is how the E, the carnage damage can get followed up by a body shot and a melee. So like I mentioned, you're gonna wanna hit Carnage as many targets as possible, but if you notice you're able to take a swing on a squishy hero who's sitting at about 200 HP, the swing itself will do 90 damage, a full body primary fire follow up, again does 80 damage, and again the melee, 30 damage, that is exactly 200 damage you'll be applying, and again that doesn't even account for bleeds or headshots. So there's some leniency there if you can either rely on that bleed or some follow up damage on top of it. And next, this one is something I was trying to make work, but realistically it doesn't actually function as smoothly as you'd like it to, uh, and that's the knife pull into the carnage swing. So theoretically, this will do 80 damage on hit with the knife, pull them towards you, swing at them with the axe, you'll do another 90, that's 170 total, which is easy follow-up given that you'll be applying bleeds, and now they're within range for shotgun shots. But because of the swing time on the axe, it doesn't quite line up perfectly, to the point where enemies can start manipulating their movement and likely get themselves out of range before you can guarantee this follow-up damage. There are longer combos that you can go for, but I've noticed from playing her that you rarely get the opportunity to stay in a fight as aggressively as you'd like to. You rarely get the opportunity to land all your cooldowns as perfectly as you'd like to, and this character needs to think as more of a scrapper than a combo focused character. It's not like Roadhog where as soon as you hit a hook you almost guarantee the kill every single time. You need to think about what options you have in the moment and what is going to be best used at any given time. If there's five targets in front of you but you see a squishy one in the back it's probably still worth going for the carnage swing even if you think you can hit that jagged knife because anything could happen that could prevent your follow up to the pull. So looking at engage opportunities, how will Junker Queen get herself into those scrappy fights? Obviously, we're going to be looking at ways to force melee range. There's some key ways to do this around different map types. We'll be looking to uh, hit flank routes to make sure we can approach fights without taking too much damage. We can look to manipulate enemy approaches if we're holding defensively, making sure we can hold tight corners and abuse choke points and things like that. And of course, there's disruption from either the knife pull ourselves, knocking people off of high grounds, pulling people through choke points, pulling people out of position where they felt comfortable. If there's any other flank pressure from our roster that the enemies have to respond to, we can use that pressure to our advantage to help close the distance and make sure that we get into the fight and get going as quickly as possible. 
Junker Queen will prefer long, drawn-out engages where she can benefit from her self-healing from the wounds on as many targets as possible. She'll love to find herself in situations where she can bait enemies into thinking they can kill her before quickly turning the tide on them with high burst damage, high isolation potential, and of course, high stabilization potential with the extra 200 HP she gives herself. One of the hardest situations you'll find yourself in fairly commonly is when the enemy team is able to outmaneuver and keep you at an arm's length for the duration of the fight. So, as I mentioned, you're always looking for that reason to force melee range, but if they're able to outkite you with better movement speed, if they're able to outrange you with better ranged options, or if they just have any amount of verticality that you can't keep up with, you'll quickly find yourself falling flat in the middle of a team fight. So be very cautious when approaching opponents that can manipulate those aspects of their play. Look to hold chokes aggressively, but don't force yourself into open spaces or too much high ground terrain where you can't keep up with other members of the cast. Another important part of her general playstyle is maximizing your wound uptime. Obviously, easier said than done, and like I mentioned, once you're in the middle of a fight, this is fairly easy to do with quick melees or carnage swings, but make sure that you're also looking for wound uptime in neutral. So this is important, of course, for generating ultimate charge and potentially with the Jagged Knife, creating all-in opportunities. You'll play for Jagged Knife throws in neutral because it is your best ranged option to keep stacks ticking on as many targets as possible. Remember, even if you don't hit a target directly, if you throw a knife at a choke point, sometimes even at spawn doors or on long predictable areas of the map, you can pull it back through multiple enemies as they're coming through those spaces to just get the bleed ticking to make sure you've got your passive healing going to make sure you can maneuver around the map and heal back the poke damage that they're likely throwing your way. The short cooldown on the Jagged Knife means that you should still have it available when priority targets do become available, but make sure you're looking to get that wound uptime going as you're maneuvering, as you're setting up your advantageous positions. When you are able to hold space aggressively, when you know enemies are forced to come into your melee range, look to get as aggressive as possible with carnage swings on multiple targets. Again, we're looking at abusing choke points and looking at areas where we know the enemy will be approaching, and then we can use these aggressive cooldowns early, get those meaningful wounds going, and then make sure we can stabilize for a longer teamfight and keep scrapping with the enemy team. Carnage has very strong burst damage potential, and by providing that self-sustain, you might find a lot of opportunities just to win the fight or go aggressive right there and then. But even against a very aggressive team, one who might push you back, it's still worth getting that Carnage swing early because that's what also helps you survive enemy aggression. Even if you can't go aggressive and find kills off the Carnage swing, you're going to want that passive healing ticking just in case you need to give up space just as much as you want it to hold that space. Pair that with, of course, Commanding Shout if you need to change positions, and you are incredibly hard to kill despite having very few defensive resources. So, when should we be looking to play Junker Queen? What teammates do we synergize with? What enemies counter her? And what kind of maps will best be suited to her playstyle? Let's take a look first at our teammates. So, when I last did this in the Sojourn video, we talked a lot about strengths and weaknesses with different types of DPS. For Junker Queen, I want to focus for our teammates on very specific synergies that I've noticed. Let's look at some specific DPS that I think Junker Queen synergizes well with. First up on the list will be Sojourn, our second newest hero to the list. Um, reason being for this is because of Sojourn's relatively flexible mobility and because of primarily the effectiveness of Disruptor Shot, you can create a lot of opportunities where Sojourn will cover your weaknesses in neutral, but also you have a strong combo opportunity where the damage over time from the Disruptor Shot and the slowing effect that it creates means that Junker Queen has an ideal brawling situation to walk into where there's multiple damage over time effects stacking on opponents and they have a hard time getting away from Junker Queen's melee range due to the slow applied. Similarly to Sojourn, we're looking at Ash Dynamite for the same reason as Disruptor Shot. The combination of Dynamite and Carnage, for example, will do almost 150 damage immediately, and then the combined damage over time from the wound and the Dynamite burn will do itself almost 150 damage again. This is an incredible tool for threatening multiple enemies all at once with both burst damage and high amounts of ticking damage over time. This is a very strong combination, and again, similar to Sojourn, Ash's range means that you can threaten unique targets that Junker Queen can't otherwise. Switching things up, our next on the synergy list for DPS is May. 
um, while obviously not boasting much range compared to Sojourn and Ash, May offers a lot in the front line that can help supplement Junker Queen's staying power. So normally Junker Queen, unless she's getting a lot of value from her wounds and able to go very aggressive on targets while self-sustaining, doesn't really keep space very well. She gets in and she gets out fairly well, but she doesn't really hold space compared to, say, a Reinhardt or an Orisa. Having a Mei in the front line can change that. The self-survivability of Mei with both her Ice Block and Ice Wall creates a lot of frontline advantages where Junker Queen alone would have to second-guess her chances. Baiting targets in with a Mei by her side becomes especially deadly. And of course, once targets are within range, the slow from Mei guarantees that when they are close, they stay close. There's plenty other of heroes that function well with Junker Queen, so just to cover uh, some general synergies here, I think she pairs well with aggressive flankers, heroes like Tracer, Genji, or Reaper. Having aggressive DPS who are able to control parts of the map on their own and quickly follow up on your aggression windows will always be a good thing for a brawly tank like Junker Queen. Since she lacks consistent options for getting herself into a fight safely, you'll be relying on these types of heroes to pull the enemy team apart into different directions and then thrive in the chaos that ensues. It is very hard to approach in a linear fashion with a tank like Junker Queen compared to a tank like Reinhardt, for example, who can put a shield up and walk in a straight line. Junker Queen does not offer that same utility to their team, so you need to play more creatively around the map, and having flanking DPS can help you do that. Having DPS like these can also help threaten unique angles, which means that any attention that Junker Queen draws into herself will open up opportunities for these fast-moving threats. Again, playing into that bait-and-switch style of tanking where you want people to focus you and you want to kite them out while sustaining and turning on them eventually means your DPS will find those opportunities sometimes even before you to get aggressive due to the spread-out nature or lingering nature of their aggression. Uh, let's look at support synergies next. I don't think there's any supports that don't work necessarily with Junker Queen, but there's a couple that stand out in terms of having strong synergies. The first of which being Ana, The anti-heal that comes from her nade, again the only other anti-heal in the game, coupled with the damage over time of wounds can turn an otherwise somewhat ignorable source of tick damage into a potentially deadly threat. Thinking similarly to Ash Dynamite and Sojourn's Disruptor Shot, if you're able to couple the AoE anti-heal from biotic grenade with something like your carnage swing onto multiple targets this can quickly become an easy team fight win for you and your allies additionally nano boost from ana is an incredible tool for junker queen whenever she's in a position to start a brawl the damage reduction and damage amplification and therefore increased healing from wounds paired with her already strong burst options make junker queen a threat the enemy wish they could ignore but will likely be doing so from their spawn room the 50% damage boost with Rampage, for example, is 150 guaranteed damage over time due to the fact that they'll be anti-healed as well. Unless they're getting Zarya bubbled or unless they have some form of damage mitigation, that is a lot of unignorable damage. Next up for support synergies is Lucio. And given her short range and limited mobility options, I don't think it's a surprise that the speed that Lucio offers is an excellent tool to help Junker Queen get into melee range. In addition to that, Lucio's kit is also very good at playing into Junker Queen's bait and switch style play, again, helping her get out of sticky situations until she can line up her high priority cooldowns. By using your commanding shout too early, it's very easy to feel like you can't get aggressive again for another 11 seconds as Junker Queen. Lucio can make up for that by either speeding you out and not forcing your shout too early or by giving you that extra reason to go in knowing that you've got the speed boost to get in range quicker. The combination of speed and over health buffs from both of these characters can also catch opponents off guard and either bait them into overextending for a kill that they can't quite catch or jump on vulnerable members aggressively who thought they had the range to keep away. Alright, synergies out of the way, let's talk about what kind of enemies that Junker Queen wants to play into or wants to avoid. And I want to make a note here saying that this is focused on individual play for Junker Queen. I'm not going to be talking about how Junker Queen plays into Rhine based compositions necessarily, but how Junker Queen plays into Rhine, for example. I wanted to make that distinction because I think there might be some surprising answers here for you guys. So first off, tanks. Junker Queen, I believe, is very strong versus mobility-based tanks. We're talking tanks like Winston, Wrecking Ball, D.Va, and Doomfist. 
the ability to disrupt movement cooldowns with the jagged knife pull means a lot of forced overextensions onto tanks like these and potentially easy punishes on these members who rely on having that high mobility in order to survive. Something I've had a lot of fun doing is throwing a knife into someone like D.Va or Winston, and then as soon as they try to jump away, instantly pulling them back in, keeping more stacks on them, and then following up with continued damage. In addition to being able to interrupt their movement, since these tanks have relatively low damage outputs, maybe except for Doomfist, it becomes fairly easy for Junker Queen to outsustain their damage output in the front line with her passive healing alone making sure that you can keep stacks on the enemy tank as well as as many threats behind them means that you can generally hold space aggressively versus these types of tanks and force their movement earlier. But what type of tanks will Junker Queen struggle against? I believe she's weak versus two types of enemy tanks, either tanks with high crowd control or tanks with high durability. And so we'll be looking at tanks like Orisa, Reinhardt, Roadhog, Sigma, or an enemy Junker Queen. Being a melee focused tank comes with inherent vulnerabilities. Any enemy tank that can capitalize on your lack of defensive cooldowns will be a tough matchup. And in addition to that, any tank that can outsustain you will easily waste your time if you get stuck fighting them. You're better off trying to ignore these types of tanks and instead working your way around them wherever possible. So for example, a tank like Roadhog doesn't seem like too much of a threat for most tanks, but since Junker Queen relies on being close range, Getting hooked out of position and forcing cooldowns early is a surefire way to make sure you never get good value out of things like your Carnage or your Commanding Shout and ensures that you're not able to get meaningful stacks on as many targets as possible and will quickly force you out of position with more damaging threats. In addition to that, CC abilities like Orisa's Javelin or Sigma's Accretion mean that you can quickly be burned down because your HP pool, well, is higher than your average DPS doesn't offer a lot in terms of self-sustain and any CC that forces you out of position or stops you from instantly casting Commanding Shout might get you burned down quickly. Looking at the other type of tanks, the high durability, again, like Reinhardt, Orisa, or even an enemy Junker Queen, you'll quickly find yourself just wasting too much time and not forcing any advantages for your team. You might keep the enemy tank busy as well, but that's about the best you can expect from these types of matchups, and you shouldn't waste too much time trying to deal with them, and it should instead try to get around or away from them to threaten more vulnerable backliners. Next up, enemy DPS lines. I believe Junker Queen is strong versus anchor type DPS, so heroes like Soldier 76, Cassidy, Hanzo, or Ash. Junker Queen's high damage output coupled with her tank HP pool means that she can often outduel these types of DPS just by walking at them, assuming that she's not closing too long of a distance. As long as she's able to get within optimal range, she can be very threatening to these types of DPS, and at the very least, they'll be forced to give up space, if not forced to revisit the spawn room. If you are approaching anchors over a longer distance, or anchors with especially long ranges, like snipers like Hanzo or Widowmaker, try to catch them off guard by moving on flank routes or by waiting for them to approach you and again abusing parts of the map like choke points and tight corners. Where Junker Queen will struggle the most is mobility focused DPS, especially those with verticality. So ones that come to mind are the Tracers, Genjis, Echoes, and Faras. These heroes have no trouble at all dancing around Junker Queen's position, and you'll be wasting your time more often than not if you're trying to hunt them down. Your best bet at countering these heroes will be again to react to their aggression and wait for them to push into your existing space. You can try to mitigate their burst damage with a defensive commanding shout, or disrupt them with a dragon knife pull to catch them off guard after they've committed movement cooldowns. Next up, the support line, and we can think very similarly here to the DPS line. We're going to be strong versus anchors, and we're going to be weak versus mobility. So we'll want matchups against heroes like Baptiste and Zenyatta. Same reasoning as DPS, their low mobility and their predictable positioning makes them easy to close the distance onto more often than not. And Zen especially, since Rampage creates an anti-heal, it can completely ignore Transcendence healing uh, as an initiation tool, so that's worth noting as well. Mobility-based supports such as Lucio and Moira, again, very hard to keep down, very easy for them to outrange you, and they even have defensive cooldowns available to outplay things like your Jagged Knife Throw. Looking at some more specific support matchups though, I think there are some specific counters that are worth mentioning here. So first off, 
and enemy Ana. While she does function as an anchored support, the anti-nade and sleep dart are both incredibly strong versus Junker Queen. Preventing her ability to self-sustain through self-healing makes Junker Queen extremely vulnerable. Her effective HP pool shrinks considerably when she gets hit by the anti-nade, and you will almost instantly be forced to either use Commanding Shout or Tuck Tail and start running. Additionally, like I said, the Sleep Dart is relatively easy to land on Junker Queen since she wants to be up close and personal and in the front line to make sure she's getting value, and the fact that her ultimate causes her to stand still and travel in a straight line means it's fairly easy for Ana to line that shot up. Next up, from the support line, another counter would be Lucio. Just like I said, the mobility alone is reason enough to try and avoid him, but also the passive speed from Lucio's aura is usually enough to keep other members of his team out of reach of Junker Queen. Unless, of course, you've got a Lucio speeding you around as well. His low cooldown boop is also an excellent disengage tool for when Junker Queen finally does manage to close the distance. And on top of all that, the passive healing from Lucio also means that most bleed damage can be basically ignored by his teammates. And finally, one more time, Sound Barrier is probably the best counter in the game to Junker Queen's Rampage Ultimate Engage. Next, and finally on the counters list for supports, would be Brigida. For very similar reasons to Lucio, actually. She can keep Junker Queen at a distance with Whip Shot and Shield Bash. She can easily proc AoE healing, since Junker Queen will also want to be up close and personal, which helps sustain the bleed damage that she's applying. And Rally can be a very strong defensive tool for stabilizing Rampage. And in addition to all of that, Brig has a shield, and the shield can block the Jagged Knife Throw and let it fall safely to the ground instead of pulling a squishy member towards the threat. Not to say that any of these quote-unquote counters can't be played against, but these are some specific interactions that you guys should be watching out for if you're choosing to play Junker Queen into these types of compositions. Next, let's look at what types of maps Junker Queen benefits most from. So, I've already mentioned a few clues, but let's talk about them and list them out here. So, obviously she likes flank routes. These help her move around the map safely and make sure that she has opportunities to get aggressive, get within melee range. She will thrive mostly on mid to short range sight lines. Obviously, those extremely long ranges will be hard to close the distance on, and long range threats like Widowmakers, Hanzos, Ashes, and Sojourns will be a lot tougher to deal with when you're not able to close that distance. Junker Queen will also prefer flat maps as opposed to a lot of verticality, just because she has no vertical movement options herself. She wants to be able to continue chasing targets, and if they can jump higher than her or get away vertically, she's not going to be able to do that. And finally, something that can help, although isn't a necessity, is the environmental kill potential on maps like Ilios. Well, like we mentioned, having that perfect setup to pull someone into the pit is one of your only pick options with the Jagged Knife since you can't really rely on it as consistently as a Roadhog hook. So what maps fit this criteria? A couple obvious answers would be King's Row or Midtown. There's very limited sight lines, the high grounds themselves are somewhat limited, there's lots of close range corners to abuse, and there's decent flank routes on every single point where Junker Queen can choose her options and choose where to position before getting aggressive. Some examples from King of the Hill would be Nepal Sanctum or Ilios Well, as I've mentioned a couple times now. There's still strong flank potential there for controlling lanes, and obviously those environmental kills are no joke. We gotta make sure we're watching out for those. Maps that Junker Queen will struggle on will be ones like, say, Coliseo or Circuit Royale, due to the lack of flank options and longer sight lines. So, Coliseo, for example, those long hallway type sight lines become very difficult to cross, and there's not a lot of options for Junker Queen to get around without being seen, and she'll likely be kited around pretty effectively. Circuit Royale, very similarly, it's basically just one long lane, which they will always see you coming and always be able to poke you down before you can get in range to do any work. Junker Queen can function fairly well on maps like New Queen Street uh, or her homestead Junker Town, which you might think wouldn't suit her due to the long range sight lines, but because there are noticeable flank routes, even though they do become somewhat disconnected, she can work here. I would say though that she would require some coordination with her teammates, usually her DPS line, to move around the map effectively due to those long ranges. And even though they have decent flank options, you need to make sure that you've got the reach from not just yourself, but from your allies as well, to control as much of that map as possible to make sure that those flanks actually pay off. Alright, and finally, 
what do we think about Junker Queen? Is she any good? Is she going to be played in the Overwatch League? Can I solo queue one trick her and climb to top 500? What do you think? Um, so let's start with individual play for the average player in your average game. Right now, we've only got quick play in the Overwatch 2 beta, but extrapolating to Overwatch 2 release in your average rank game, I think Junker Queen can be incredibly strong if in the right hands and if not getting directly countered. Since she is a very demanding character mechanically and in terms of game sense, you'll need to know a lot about the game and about the character to maximize her potential. You'll need to know exactly when to go in and when to back out or risk getting punished. You'll also need the mechanics to make sure you're hitting those close range shots, hitting those jagged knife throws, and maximizing your wound up time and maximizing your damage output. She plays somewhat similarly to Roadhog, but she's got longer opportunity windows, as in she doesn't just look for a hook and then back out like Roadhog does. She functions somewhat like a noob stomper type hero. If the enemy team doesn't respect your damage output or expects to be able to kill you too easily, they'll quickly find themselves falling flat against your self-sustain and you'll easily be able to punish them. But in macro play, in organized team play, in leagues like the Overwatch League, I don't think she provides much value, unfortunately. She functions basically like a big DPS. She doesn't have very, very strong durability in more coordinated situations. Proper damage focus will burn her down quickly since she lacks a lot of defensive utility. And her sustain doesn't really cover enough to counteract that. Her playstyle is too damage focused and not enough utility focus. There are enough characters in the game, and most of them being played from the DPS line, that focus on just doing meaningful damage. You need tools in an Overwatch League environment, in a coordinated Overwatch environment, to create damage opportunities, not just capitalize on them. I don't think Junker Queen does enough to create those opportunities, so I don't think she'll be seeing much play in coordinated play, despite being able to do a lot of damage. But that's all for me today. Let me know what you guys think. Uh, have you been playing Junker Queen? Are you having as much fun as I am while playing her? Have you discovered any cool interactions that I might have missed in this video? Let me know down in the comments below. Uh, and finally, I'd like to thank Questline Esports for once again helping me produce this video. Be sure to check out their show, The High Ground, where the Questline team and myself will be bringing in guests from the Overwatch community to talk about Overwatch news, the Overwatch League, and upcoming events in the space. Check out the description below for a link to their channel. But that's all for me, guys. Thank you guys for watching so much. I appreciate the support, and I'll see you guys in the next one.